Between 1957 and 1962, a new medication was offered to hundreds of thousands of pregnant women to aid with morning sickness, and it was advertised as a safe sedative. But for thousands, they would give birth to children with life-altering deformities, most infants dying shortly after birth. Many more would suffer miscarriages unaware as to the cause. The medication responsible was called thalidomide, an over-the-counter med available all over the world that when taken by pregnant women would result in tragedy. In today's video, we shall cover the dark origins of the dangerous medication, its effects on so many, and the consequences for those affected. Thalidomide was produced by the West German pharmaceutical company Chemi Grunenthal in the late 1950s. This company, however, has a rather controversial founding. It was set up by a former Nazi party member, Hermann Wurtz, a man who massively profited from the regime. Post-war, the company was founded to produce much-needed medication to the war-torn country. Whilst many companies, including those of the victors, recruited convicted war criminals, there was a disproportionate number of such people working for Grunenthal, and often in leading positions. These included prominent Nazi scientists Heinrich Merkter, Werner Schulemann, and Otto Ambros, all of whom played a key role in the development of the medication. The large number of convicted war criminals working for the company were mainly racial hygienists, former SS researchers, and those who had experimented on unwilling prisoners. Thalidomide was originally synthesized by the Swiss pharmaceutical company Chemical Industry Basel and was acquired by Grunenthal in the late 1950s. There is, however, suspicion that the medication was actually developed during the war as an antidote to sarin nerve gas, such gas being something that Otto Ambrose developed. It was initially dismissed as useless, though it was discovered by the German company that it could be used as a sedative. Whilst the medication was tested on rodents, there was little else done to test its safety for humans. As it was deemed impossible to give the test animals a lethal dose of thalidomide, it was deemed safe enough for humans. The testing was limited, only done on a few animals and not on primates. Nor was any small-scale human testing carried out as to the safety of thalidomide. Crucially, no testing was done as to the effects on either pregnant animals or pregnant humans. Although at the time, there was little consideration given to the effects of medication on pregnant women, as it was thought, they could not pass through the placental barrier. But thalidomide, along with many other medications, are in fact capable of passing through the placental barrier and affecting the fetus with devastating results. Despite the lax testing, thalidomide was made available to dozens of countries licensed under a different name. Perhaps part of the reason for the rush to the market can be attributed to the large bonus that Heinrich Merkter received for expediting distribution of the medication. In the UK, thalidomide went under the name Distival, produced by the Distillers Company. Otto Ambros just so happened to work as an advisor for the company. Adverts for the drug all claimed it was perfectly safe, an alternative to potentially harmful sedatives. Some even stressed that the child's safety would be dependent on the medication. Thalidomide was offered to an unaware public to treat flus, nausea, and morning sickness. For those experiencing morning sickness, such symptoms usually start occurring 28 days into the pregnancy, during what is termed the critical period. During the first trimester, key weeks determine how the fetus will develop, with certain windows of development being crucial for the brain, legs, etc. It is during this time that deformities can develop. Thalidomide is teratogenic, meaning it can cause abnormalities during pregnancy if taken within 20 to 36 days into the pregnancy. The eyes, brain, ears, arms, and legs can all be affected. The condition perhaps most associated with thalidomide is phocomalia, where the person's arms or legs are underdeveloped. This can present with shorter arm and leg bones, fused fingers, or bones completely absent. Whilst limbs can be the most obvious signs, a person affected can also present with ear and eye abnormalities, limiting hearing and vision. There can also be issues with underdeveloped lungs and also a distorted digestive tract. Many of the women given thalidomide experienced miscarriages. It is thought that anywhere between 60,000 and 100,000 people were affected by miscarriages, including our very own maternal grandmother. 
As for those children born, it is thought that less than 40% survived the early stages of infancy, often dying only a few months old. In many instances, the newborns were taken straight away from their mothers, left unaware as to what was going on. Whilst almost 50 countries were exposed to thalidomide, some prohibited its distribution. The US was largely spared from the thalidomide tragedy due to the remarkable work of one individual pharmacist, Francis Oldham Kelsey. Her early work involved showing the dangers of certain solvents, playing a role in the passing of legislation for the standards of cosmetics. But Kelsey's keen interest was in medications that cause congenital defects. In 1960, she was employed by the Food and Drug Administration, one of only a handful of pharmacologists assessing the safety of medications. She had not been there for a month before she was tasked with reviewing an application by drug company Richardson Merrill and its request to distribute thalidomide. The request was that it was to be dealt with quickly, and the company had already distributed some 20,000 tablets as part of a permitted marketing ploy. Kelsey, however, was steadfast in refusing the application, on the basis that there was little to no evidence of its safety. In particular, Kelsey sought further information into a British study that suggested a link between the medication and nerve damage. She insisted on a full-scale test of the medication. This was something that had never been attempted. Kelsey's insistence would be proven as entirely justified when in 1962, a direct link between the birth defects and thalidomide was established, with at least 10,000 children affected. Due to Kelsey's actions, the devastating effect of the medication was limited, though 17 children were unfortunately born with thalidomide-related deformities in the US. For her role in preventing the widespread availability of the medication, she was presented the President's Award for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service by President John F. Kennedy in 1962. The credit for exposing the link between thalidomide and birth defects can largely be attributed to doctors Vidikant Lenz and William McBride. Dr. Lenz was a German pediatrician who had noticed a large number of deformities affecting newborns. In November of 1961, Lenz presented his observations to Kemi Grunenthal. He explained that of the 14 children born with deformities, all of their mothers had taken thalidomide during the early stages of their pregnancies. He contrasted this with 20 other women who delivered children without deformities who had not taken the medication, apart from one who had taken it towards the end of the pregnancy. Within 13 days of Lenz contacting them, Kemi Grunenthal withdrew the medication from the market. The observations of Lenz were supported by Dr. William McBride. In December of 1961, Dr. McBride wrote a letter to the Lancet Medical Journal, questioning whether there was a link between birth defects and thalidomide. However, it is claimed by some that the link was first noticed by a midwife named Pat Sparrow. It is asserted that she is the one who noticed that it was only the children of the women under McBride's care that were affected by the spike of limb deformities. McBride prescribed thalidomide to his patients, whilst others did not. He initially dismissed Sparrow's observations, but would later seek alternative opinions through the Lancet Journal. For thousands all over the world, there would be now a long fight for justice and compensation for the damage done by thalidomide. One of the first steps would be criminal charges brought against a number of Kemi Grunenthal officials, these charges being negligent homicide and injury. After a two and a half year trial, a settlement was reached for some of the victims in Germany, though with no finding of guilt on the company official's part. One-off payments were given depending on the seriousness of the disability and the needs of the child, along with a monthly stipend. A foundation was established with the money provided by both the company and by the West German government. Such payments took years to come through due to the criminal case taking precedent. During the investigation, the company was described as obstructive, and there are concerns about the impartiality of the trial process. A link will be made available to a Guardian article for those who wish to read further. It would take another 50 years for Kemi Grunenthal to issue an apology for the scandal. In the UK, a campaign launched by the Sunday Times for compensation was eventually successful. The distiller's company paid out around £28 million in compensation for those affected. But for those who survived childhood, exposure to thalidomide severely affected their lives. Many required prosthetics to help them navigate the world. One of the key conditions that affects thalidomide survivors is that their bones and muscles will be that of a much older person. 
The strain put on their limbs causes early onset arthritis and other joint pain. Many survivors have gone on to lead fulfilling lives. Some lead the way building networks of support for survivors, whilst educating doctors about the differences in anatomy to better serve the needs of the survivors. One example that I can personally recall is that of Lorraine Mercer, who was selected as an Olympic torch carrier for the London Olympic Games, shifting a light on the cause. You might well think that due to the clear evidence of the dangers of thalidomide, that it is a medication no longer used, but this is not the case. In Brazil, it is available, and so there are cases of babies born with thalidomide-related deformities. It is in large part due to the prevalence of leprosy in Brazil, and it happens to be that thalidomide is used to treat the disease. Thalidomide is also used to treat various forms of cancer. Whilst there may be some benefits to the medication, it should never be forgotten the damage it can cause and the vital importance of it not being given to pregnant women. Thalidomide dramatically changed how we view medicines. It altered how we viewed the risk of taking medications, and it clearly showed us how vital rigorous testing truly is. But the story of thalidomide is truly disturbing. From its origins amongst post-war Nazi criminals, to its rapid adoption around the world, and to the impact it had on both mothers and survivors.